Mr. Scott. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, first off, I want to welcome, extra welcome for Mr. Eisenstadt, Stu Eisenstadt. Uh, we both share the Atlanta connection. Uh, him going back to the early days when we both had more hair and it was certainly what uh, as white as both of ours are and our starting out with, the, with the then Congressman Andrew Young and uh, you've moved on up and served uh, President Jimmy Carter, Bill Clinton and I followed your career and I just wanted to take a moment to welcome you and it's a pleasure to um, to have this opportunity to enter exchange with a longtime friend. And to all of you, uh, certainly this has been a very, very informative hearing. Um, <clears throat> let me start by taking a look at, at the situation that I think presents an opening for us here with the situation involving the resignation of Mr. Wolfowitz. Uh, because I think in the course of accountability and transparent, transparency, here lies an opportunity. I noticed when um, I think Mr. Watt asked a question relative to this, you, I think someone, I think it was you, Mr. Stiglitz, I hope I pronounced that right, uh, referred that the reason we have an American at the helm is because normally we have an American at the helm of the World Bank and we have a European at the helm of the IMF and that, uh, but it, it's a little bit more than that, I, th I think a little addition to that. And in, in fact, when it was first started, that it was because of uh, the fact that the United States was a key guarantor of the bonds and uh, put us in a much more, put the World Bank in a much more reliable financial position. Now we have an opportunity, there's some discussion, there's also some ear that it's not Democrat to have that there and maybe would add it, there would be added transparency if we chose not to have an American there for the first time. What would we lose in terms of that financial stability to move forward on that having an American at the helm of the World Bank presents compared to any added transparency accountability one might achieve uh, by not having an American at the helm. Uh, anyone, over, I would like to have your comments on that. Just to, well, do you I agree think we, we would lose, lose anything, gain no. anything, we should we, keep we, it? We, we'll, I, I, in, terms of finan in terms of finance, it would make absolutely no difference. Do you think this is an opportunity we should seize and that it would be in the best interest of the bank going forward on some of these issues that we not have an American at the helm? Very much so. Is that the consensus? Is anyone a different opinion? I, I think it is. I mean, this was a central feature of our Atlantic Council report. Well, thank you. Another line of question, if I may continue. Does the, um, does the World Bank um, plan to implement improved strategies to reduce poverty in countries by aiming strategies uh, only on boosting overall growth, as is evident that this strategy may miss opportunities to reduce poverty. Example, I understand the reason behind focusing on sectors with growth potential, allowing for relatively quick payoffs. However, my question is, do these strategies impact poverty reduction in the most efficient way. Um, while you're thinking about that, that's, there's a recent report in the Washington uh, Post, which is entitled The Persistently Poor. And a report has come out where uh, it, it really strikes a mixed message. Um, if I may share, Mr. Chairman, just so you, as you're thinking about this, this is where this question comes from. It's written by Mr. Peter S. Goodman, came out late last year, in case you read it. It says, an internal report criticizes the World Bank's efforts on poverty. Despite an intensified campaign against poverty, World Bank programs have failed to lift incomes in many poor countries over the past decade, leaving tens of millions of people suffering, stagnating, or declining living standards, according to a report that was released. 
by the bank's autonomous assessment arm. You are familiar with that report or not? It says that among 25 poor well, countries. Why don't we get to the, I think we get to the uh, answers now. Yeah, all right. Really yes, Let me ask you this, if I may, Mr. Chairman, on that, that point, because I wanted to get at Africa, because I believe when you look at many of these other countries where you've, you've, you, you've had some success, but in Africa, it's, a, it's been a stubborn problem there. To what degree is the political instability, the, 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 the violent regimes, the, um, I'm, I'm reminded of scenes where even with food being dropped at an airport, uh, the regimes are going to blow up the food. People coming in trying to help the, communi the communities were unacceptable. Um, sort of reminds me of that uh, scene in the, uh, the Apocalypse Now. I don't know if you've seen that scene where he comes in and he, and Marlon Brando says, well, you know, I remember this time when he came in and they inoculated all these children against a vaccine. And then they left the village and they came back and he said he saw a very pathetic sight. He saw all of these inoculated arms cut off in a heap. Um, and, and in some places within Africa, uh, I'm, I'm wondering what role, what, what impact does, the, uh, does the, the, the violence and the instability of the political situation and the dictators and the regimes have in, in being a, a, a hindrance to, to your... Dr. White. Uh, the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Scott, uh, five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. How can China deal with, uh, how, are the, how do they deal with uh, freedom of the press during the Olympics when they suppress the press as a rule in their country? There is a dichotomy here that doesn't fit. Examine that for me. How are they going to uh, achieve or believe in uh, uh, censorship and how will censorship play a role in the press coverage of the Olympics? You see, here's an opportunity for China. It's sort of like giving a man a rope. He can usually either pull himself up or hang himself. Are the Chinese thinking seriously about using this as an opportunity to show the world, here's who we really are, and use the Olympics as a curtain to raise a curtain to show the new China in terms of freedom and all the things that the Olympic stand for. And the other part of that question I want you to ask is why hasn't the International Olympic Committee held China accountable for not undertaking the promises it made when they were trying to get the Olympics? If I may, I'd like to talk about uh, China and three entities. First of all, very quickly, could you tell me in each of your opinions the status of the level of tensions between Russia and China and what's causing it? And if it goes unattended, what could be the consequences brewing between Russia and China? I'll, I'll take a quick stab at it. Uh, first of all, I think they, at one level, have passably good relations. So I wouldn't say at the moment I would categorize this as a problematic relationship or a highly problematic one for China. So I wouldn't worry as a matter of state policy that the Russians are and Chinese are going to be comprehensively cooperating against our interests. I think oh. it's very much a issue by issue kind of situation. Okay. Uh, and one can slip in the other. I want to get my points in. Iran. What is your understanding of the uh, Dr. Libertal or Dr. Yang, um, uh, China's uh, relationship with Iran, and how has China's position on Iran's nuclear program evolved um, over the past few years, and what factors continue to shape China's position on Iran, and what are the prospects for an expanded role for China in the UNSC's um, plus Germany's negotiations with Iran? Uh, clearly, I'm not an expert on this, um, but uh, I want to answer your question in a general term. Chinese government, it is in 
the interest of the Chinese government to ally with all the dictatorships in the world. So you say for political reason. Mm -hmm. So if Iran, I think it's still the key issue: democratization. That's that's something I want to talk about. Right. So we are facing a lot of problems with China. The problem is so difficult simply because China is, demo is not democratic. So I think it is time to seriously think the question how to help China democratize. So you're saying that China is indeed an ally yes. with Iran. Yes. Is that general consensus here? Yeah. Yeah. Would you say that they uh, love uh, Iran more than they love the United States? <laughs> no. Okay. I'd associate myself with those remarks, and I, I think, in fact, there's a great admiration for the United States and China reflected in mm -hmm. they've had 60,000 students and scholars here for the last two decades plus. Do you feel that they have in any way assisted with supplies or materials in their uh, enrichment program? I'm, I'm not so. privy to what our intel community may have. Uh, from what I know, I'm not aware of any specific. My final point, I got 44 seconds. I want to get to Defar, D D Defar for example, uh, for, uh, before we go. I, I want to get, how do you feel the United States should address China's role in the genocide in Defar? I mean, it's really, really staggering. I don't know if anybody has brought the statistics lately, but it's resulted in more than 500,000 um, uh, displacements and uh, deaths. Uh, more than 2,500,000 Sudanese have been displaced. The actions of the John Shaweed uh, and, and the government of Sudan have been repeatedly described as genocide. Um, it is clearly the most pressing uh, an important humanitarian crisis in the world. What more can the United States do to address China's role in this? What should we be doing? And, and quickly, please. Well, I'd, I'd just like to see China um, curtail its investment in Darfur and the oil industry that produces. Of course, that's going to have consequences potentially for world oil prices, and you'll all be concerned about. We'll all be concerned about that. Uh, I would just point out when we look at China in Darfur, you probably ought to also look at the behavior of India in this respect. So I think the the U.S. government has sent too many messages to China that they can get away with whatever they do. So I think we really need to uh, seriously consider this problem. The uh, time of the gentleman has expired.